It's not an easy task to build a top-tier NFL defense. It requires careful management of talent, pinpoint scouting accuracy, and a scheme that's able to maximize the potential of each one of your players. While defenses are able to remain solid by landing a home run draft pick every once in a while, or signing veterans in order to make a run in the playoffs, the greatest defenses in NFL history were a product of great team building and roster management in order to bring young defensive players together in their primes. The Legion of Boom was just that, an invention of Pete Carroll and his coaching staff that ended up becoming one of the defining lights-out defenses in all of football. With arguably the best secondary of all time, and talent all over that roster, nearly every player's name is recognizable for how excellent they were in Seattle's scheme. With the recent release of Cam Chancellor, who's the last remaining member of the trio that gave the LOB its name, the long decline of the historic Seahawks defense is now in the books forever. So today, I'd like to take a moment to sit down and reflect on the marvel that was the Legion of Boom, and what happened that led to where we stand now. Before I get into things though, don't forget to share this video with your friends if you enjoy what I do here on the channel. It really helps out the community we have to continue to grow. Now to begin, let's jump into before any of the key pieces of the Legion of Boom had even played a snap in the NFL for the first time. To go back to the very beginning of even the entirety of the Seahawks Super Bowl run, we have to start with Pete Carroll himself. After a near decade of coaching USC's powerhouse college football team, Carroll took over the Seahawks in the wake of Jim Mora's disappointing 5-11 season. Despite the appearance of a multi-year rebuild being on the table, he wasted no time in cleaning house and overhauling the entire roster, as alongside GM John Schneider, over 200 transactions were made over his first season as head coach. He set a new foundation through the draft, with young excellent defensive players like Earl Thomas in the first round and Cam Chancellor later in the fifth. The team still had a number of holes and a lot of inexperience, and they'd finished that season 7-9, and nine, but in an extremely odd scenario, that was actually enough to secure the division and make the playoffs as the first team in NFL history with a losing record. Even if you don't quite remember how odd their road to the playoffs was, I'm sure that you can at least remember one particular play that happened in the very first playoff game of the Pete Carroll era. After upsetting the defending Super Bowl champs, Seattle would fall out of the playoffs and move on to the next offseason, where they added other key defensive additions and fifth rounder Richard Sherman in the draft. They'd also signed Canadian football cornerback Brandon Browner in free agency. Now, Pete Carroll's always been a unique personality as a player's coach, and his philosophy can be summed up with the idea that preparation and competition are everything, and winning football games is merely an extension of that work. In the Seahawks secondary, that particular outlook would resonate with their core group of guys, many of whom were already underdogs that were looking to outwork everyone else on the field. Within just two years, and before they even knew anything for sure, Carroll had brought together the pieces to create one of the most combative and hungry units in football, and they hadn't even gotten started yet. 2011 was a year of finding an identity as a team, and though the offense struggled throughout the season, the defense got stronger as players began to come into their own, particularly in the secondary with Thomas, Chancellor, Browner, and Sherman. Despite another 7-9 finish, all it would take Pete Carroll was one more draft to fully establish a team that could move the ball on offense and command respect in both run and pass defense. The most notable pickups from the following draft were Bruce Irvin, Bobby Wagner, and Russell Wilson, the man who is now the highest paid player in NFL history as of recording this video. 2012 would mark a turning point for the Hawks, not just in success, but also in attitude. Before the year began, the secondary had already been dubbed the Legion of Boom by fans, which is the most badass name for a defense since at least the 80s. And not long after that, they'd make a habit of following up on the hype that was surrounding them. Coach Chris Richard, who was promoted to defensive backs coach in 2012, had long established a playstyle in his DBs that emphasized physicality and aggression. To instill that attitude in practice, receivers would run routes holding chest shields that his players would aim for. On paper, they employed a system that wasn't particularly complex, but utilized the physical gifts of their guys to a T. With Sherman, Chancellor, and Browner all 6 foot 3 or taller, and the top roaming free safety in Earl Thomas patrolling deep middle, the Seahawks secondary could really match up with any player anywhere on the field, and with an emphasis on punching the ball out and jumping passes when the opportunity arose, there wasn't going to be a single yard just handed to the opposition. Their confidence would begin to build as a unit through the 2012 season, bolstered by Richard Sherman's legendary trash-talking skills, which was just as much of an element of his game as anything else. In the first official year of the Legion of Boom, the Seahawks would go undefeated at home and secure a spot in the playoffs behind rookie quarterback Russell Wilson, eventually losing to the Atlanta Falcons in the divisional round. But now equipped with a strong defense that finished first in points allowed, a competent quarterback, and a star running back, the Seahawks were about to take flight higher than ever. Part of the beauty of getting things right in the draft is the immense flexibility it affords your roster for years to come, and with a franchise quarterback and the entirety of your new superstar defense on rookie contracts, it was needless to say that the Seahawks were about to make some moves to become a Super Bowl contender. 
With that extra cap space, they brought in solid veteran additions in Cliff Averill and Michael Bennett at defensive end, players who would continue to solidify the defense from the outside in and put even more pressure on opposing quarterbacks. After the top secondary in the NFL got even more help in the offseason, it was complete domination. Across 16 games, the Legion of Boom would allow an average of 172 passing yards per game, 14.4 points per game, and they racked up 28 interceptions. All of those statistics led the NFL. They hardly ever gave up a deep play over the middle of the field, with only 8 attempts from opposing teams on the entire season, and allowed an anemic 63.4 passer rating across the whole secondary. They were going to do everything in their power to prevent you from catching the ball, but if you happened to, you were still going to pay. That was part of their philosophy. Their growing rivalry with Jim Harbaugh's 49ers was easily one of the best in the league, and after splitting their regular season series, they met again in the NFC Championship game, whose ending would go down in NFL history. The Seahawks defense would force turnovers on all three of the 49ers' fourth quarter possessions, perfectly summing up the dominant season that their secondary had already completed. The game would be sealed by a tipped pass from Richard Sherman, prompting his now infamous post-game rant to Aaron Andrews. Well, I'm the best corner in the game. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're going to get. Don't you ever talk about me. That's just who they were on the field, uncaged and always over-the-top energetic. And it worked. It was beautiful to watch, especially as a guy who has always had a soft spot for great defense. But as awesome as their performance in the NFC Championship game was, it couldn't hold a candle to what they accomplished two weeks later in the Super Bowl. They met Peyton Manning's Broncos, who were not only the best offense in the league, but historically one of the best passing offenses of all time, averaging over 295 yards through the air and nearly 39 points per game, the most in NFL history. Did any of that matter at all? Absolutely not, because in one of the ugliest Super Bowls of all time, the Broncos were held to one touchdown all game long in a 43-8 blowout. Through the first 26 minutes of regulation, they held MVP Peyton Manning to 56 passing yards. They were fast, brutal, and uncompromisingly dominant to the point that you wanted to turn off the TV, and a lot of people did. This Super Bowl win was not only the highest peak that the LOB would ever reach, but also the Seattle Seahawks as a whole because while they didn't just disappear, things would never top this moment again. The following year would be a similar story for the Seahawks defense, who was by now the most feared group in the NFL. They continued to suffocate offenses, again holding opposing teams to the fewest points in the league for the third year in a row. Though they struggled in the start of the season, they'd pull together and finish 12-4 in order to secure a number one seed in the playoffs. After taking care of business, they'd end up with their second consecutive Super Bowl berth. But despite an excellent game on both sides and some truly incredible plays, only one of them would forever be remembered as its defining moment. Play clock at five. Pass is intercepted at the goal line by Malcolm Butler. In miracle fashion, the Patriots pulled a victory out of their hat and sealed the game with only 25 seconds left to play. That game would end up being a devastating blow to Seattle, who had not only been torched by Tom Brady for over 300 yards and four touchdowns, but had squandered away what looked like the start of a potential dynasty. Now, it wouldn't be right to say that one play is what led to their disintegration, but there's no question that it certainly didn't help at all. Sports Illustrated wrote an article last year that chronicled the building resentment of where the team had been heading around the time of that Super Bowl loss. Many players on the defense had begun to think that their quarterback Russell Wilson had been too coddled by their coach and didn't have any accountability. But in the same sense, the defense had certainly taken on a life of its own, and their immense success had driven a wedge through the locker room any time there were team struggles. But no matter what was going on behind the scenes after Super Bowl 49, it was about to create a hell of a hangover. To have years of effort and passion reduced to a mistake that you had no part in personally, that's gotta mess with you, and it makes you question what you're even doing in the first place. Despite the best efforts of those in and around the team, the years that would follow would always live in the shadow of what seemed like it should have been, and the Seahawks would never make it back to the Super Bowl in the Legion of Boom era. So how did it all just come to an end? Well, no matter what happened in that game, they weren't going to stay together forever no matter what as a result of age and the big contract money that each of their key players did deserve. That writing was quick to show up on the wall as well, because as early as the very next offseason, Cam Chancellor held out due to a contract dispute. Though he'd return in week three, and the year would still be filled with incredible moments and another year of first in scoring defense, it was a step back as a unit overall. After exiting in the playoffs that year, 2016 would see yet another huge drop in performance. Despite high expectations as a team, Seattle could never fully live up to them, and every single issue would continue to deepen the divides that were causing turmoil in the locker room. The roster would continue to change and have its own problems as the years went on, and the growing consensus was that a lot of players were unhappy with how everything was being managed between meetings, contract discussions, practices, and everything else in between. 
And to add on to all of that, injuries now plague the same team that used to have the most energy and swagger of any group in the league. And despite the fact that they still remained a top NFC contender, the atmosphere was just different in Seattle. Blowups on the sidelines became more and more frequent, and there was far more blame than brotherhood that seemed to be being passed around. In 2017 though, they'd really start to see the first of players be ready to actually leave. The offensive line had become an immense concern along with Russell Wilson's health as he was sacked 43 times, and the injuries began to pile up alarmingly fast. In the middle of the season, Cam Chancellor suffered a neck injury that would threaten his football career entirely, and one that he will never likely return from. His fellow founding member of the Legion, Richard Sherman, would struggle with Achilles issues through the entire year before eventually rupturing his Achilles in week 10 of that season. That would also be his last game in a Seahawks uniform, as he would eventually sign with the 49ers the very next offseason. Playing with the speed and intensity that the LOB always had had taken its toll, and now it was spelling the end of an era. The team lacked the identity that it had built for so many years, and players were ready to move on with their lives regardless of what could have been for Pete Carroll's Seahawks. Though the team was a product of years of excellent drafting, the years that followed were not as kind, especially in the later rounds of the draft, leaving the unit without the future generation that had always given it such energy. Many of the key pieces that brought Seattle its success over time were those who had become the biggest critics of the organization. This was embodied perfectly in one last contract holdout from Earl Thomas, where he eventually gave up and returned to the team, only to suffer a season-ending injury just weeks later. That reaction is not a representation of what the Seahawks had been, but it seemed to represent how their veterans had felt it had become. Though the foundation that Seattle built its dominance on was never going to last forever, it's hard not to wonder what really could have been. Now the Seahawks still have an excellent coach, a star quarterback, and continue to find ways to win games and make the playoffs year after year, so it isn't like they cannot move on without the secondary that carried them to the Super Bowl in 2013 and 2014. There are still excellent players on both sides of the ball, and if they were able to draft top talent once, there's no reason that they hypothetically can't pull it off again. But whether it was egos, mismanagement, or a combination of it all, the Legion of Boom is now fully disbanded once and for all. So until the next historic defense emerges out of thin air, let's just all take solace in the agreement that they should have just run the damn ball.